Morning, morning. Okay, great. Um, you guys might want to grab your coffee, fill up, and get settled because we have a wonderful day planned for you and we want to start pretty much on time. Uh, <clears throat> let, uh, let me welcome you to Making a Difference 2023, Reimagining Animal Welfare. We are delighted that you decided to spend your day with us. I'm Diane Parrish, founder of Making a Difference Now, and I have to tell you, I'm personally excited to be back live and in person in a room full of people who work to make life better for people and pets in our community. So I am personally delighted that you are here too. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, because there are people who make it possible for us to have this day, please join me in thanking them in just a second too. Our amazing presenters who share their time and talent so graciously and so generously, and our sponsors whose support makes it possible for us to offer conferences like this in the first place. So please let's thank them all. There are breakout rooms on either side of this room and on the far side of Expo Hall. Um, An Expo is one of the really cool things about our conferences, I think, because it's a chance for all of us to mill together and to talk with people from other organizations who are also doing really important work for pets and people in our communities. So we encourage you to spend time in Expo Hall at all the Expo breaks and to you know, talk with other folks there as, as often as you can. We have such a cool slate of accomplished speakers for you today and that is why we are all here. So I'm excited to get to it and I hope you are as excited as I am. It is my honor and my pleasure to introduce our keynote presenter, Kenny Lamberti. Kenny presented for us at our 2018 conference. We loved him then and we are thrilled that he is coming back to speak with us again. Kenny is motivational, inspiring, knowledgeable from a multitude of perspectives, public school teacher, social worker, kennel manager, advocacy, policy, direct care, vision to execution, building connections and understanding among diverse groups and within organizations, community-based programs in local underserved communities to implementing national programs for animal welfare organizations and leading initiatives for Harvard. Kenny brings all these perspectives and his unique personal story to create compelling visions of how we can be and do better. You're about to see what I mean. Please help me welcome Kenny Lamberti. There's, what's more uncomfortable than having someone talk about you to other people? I, can't, I hate it. I can't even look. Um, <clears throat> well, first, I, I want to thank Diane and folks for having me come back down. Um, like Diane said, I feel like we've all, all been locked up for a long time, literally and figuratively, and the world's gone a little bit kind of bananas, not just in the animal welfare world. So I always like to start now when I go out and I talk to people to kind of set a tone for the day because not only have we been stuck in our homes, the world's gotten super tense. I'm sure everybody feels it. Everyone I talk to, my wife works in public health and I do a lot of work. I live in New Orleans now. I'm originally from Boston and people are tense. We've also gotten incredibly polarized, right? And I think for one day while we're here, or at least while I'm up here, you can fight with each other at other times, but I think it's really important to try to forget all the kind of intense tribal nature that the country's taken on, because it affects the way we do our jobs. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, but if you're a Democrat or a Republican, or if you're 
um, it, love no kill or you don't like no kill. The same things that happen in our lives and in the world affect animal welfare. You know, I worked for Best Friends for a while, and you know, Best Friends is big on the no-kill movement. And I worked at HSUS for seven years prior to that. I literally got hate mail. I, I should bring it to share with people because I went to a no-kill organization. And the same kind of climate is now, I think, really negatively affecting our country, whether it's race, whether it's gender, whether it's all the things that are happening in the world today that are constantly bombarding us, whether it's TV on those stupid little devices we carry around 24 hours a day in our phones. We're being bombarded with all this stuff that's kind of radicalizing us to a side or to a team or to a tribe or to, an, to a, a label or a name. And I think it's really poisoning us as people. Um, I think, and it does affect the work we do, whether it's for animals, whether it's for people. We live in these spaces where we're so tight and we're, and we're, we're assessing people. You look at, probably people look at me now, oh, is he a liberal or is he a Republican? Is, is, you know, he's got all those tattoos, is he a convict? Is he a maniac? Like, who knows, right? But for one day, I also, I, um, on my side, which is kind of not really my side hustle, I teach meditation and do Reiki, and I've studied martial arts intensely for a long, long time. So I, I'm trying harder and harder to be more kind of zen and calm in my life and open. So I, want to, I always like to start with that, like to be open to ideas that maybe are contrary to all the ones that you hold so close to your heart and in your mind. I think it's really important. If we're not open to new ideas, in whatever capacity and whatever way they're delivered to us, we're stagnant. And being stagnant is the opposite of progress. And if we want to make progress for people, for pets, for communities, and our personal lives, we have to be open to new things. You know, I'm a, I go to the gym every day, and I exercise every day. If I'm not open to try new things, I'm 54 years old now. My body does not work the way it used to work anymore. Every day I wake up and I, I'm like the tin man. I have to oil myself up and get things going. So I have to learn new things. I used to always hate yoga. Now I have to do it. I still don't really like it, but it's good for me, right? And so that mindset of being open to new things, of being willing to explore new ideas, is going to help you help more animals. It's going to help you help more people. It's going to help you be a better colleague. You know, now every organization is doing or starting to think about things like DEI, right? Diversity, equity, inclusion. They're talking about work culture. The culture of working in general is changing. It's not the way it used to be. And it's not just because of what happened in COVID, right? It's happening a lot because these 20-somethings that are coming into the world are like, we're not going to just get worked to death the rest of our lives. We want to actually be healthy. We want to be happy. We want to do a good job. A lot of the older people, like me, I'm trying not to be this way, we're resistant to that. Because when you get older, you're always resistant to the younger people. And they, hate, they think we're idiots when we're older. We think they're idiots because they're young and dumb. But the truth is both have something really important and valuable to offer and how we can create better workplaces for each other and do our work better. So I start with that. Um, just keep yourself open. For at least the time I'm up here yapping, keep yourself open, OK? So I start, my uh, presentation is a little different than what you typically see in animal welfare. I hate PowerPoints, so my slides are the boringest slides you'll ever see. When I talk later, I have two slides. This one, I think I have five with no pictures, no videos, nothing. So I want to, I want to, I want to kind of wrap with you guys, so I don't want to have a fancy PowerPoint. But my conversation is going to be about people. Um, you heard Diane say, my, I have had two careers. My first career was people. I was a, a parent and family advocate in the Head Start program where I grew up in Boston. I'm a city kid. I come from pretty humble beginnings. Um, not a lot of money, not a lot of uh, resources. And so I wanted to help people that grew up similar to me, you know, working class uh, and, and people dealing with poverty. And so I was, uh, worked for the Head Start program. I worked um, doing community organizing around poverty, around um, race equity for mo a lot of the uh, black and Latino population in my community. I worked with people. But what I did that for 15 years. After that, um, I, I loved, always loved dogs. Dogs, I like cats too, don't freak out, but I love dog, more of a dog guy. Um, I always loved dogs. And what I found through my work was that everyone had dogs. Like I had a, there are a couple social workers in here, am I right? Social workers, 
along with animal welfare people, are some of the most overworked, exhausted, under-resourced, supported people in the world. So for, I also forgot to say to just say thank you. Like this has been a hard couple of years. What you guys are dealing with every day in the kennels and what we're dealing with societally, is, it's been a real challenge. So I also hope you're taking care of yourself because you need to, because um, you can't, givers and people who want to do for others and be of service run themselves into the ground. Um, social workers, like we have back there, Every social worker I've ever known, and myself, when I did that type of work, all my families had cats and dogs. And I had always wished I could help. I'm like, I, I'm so focused on helping the family, the children, the, the parents, that I would sit and see their dogs. And I'm like, I wish I knew how to help the dog. I wish I knew how to help the cat. You know, I have my own dogs, and I loved them. And I knew how hard it was for me making the millions of dollars I was making being a social worker. Um, it's a joke. I don't have any money. Uh, but I think that's where, when we talk about reimagining animal welfare, I don't think there's a, animal welfare exists. I think we've created this illusion that the pets are our clients and that the animals are the mission. But raise your hand if a cat or a dog's ever called you to advocate for services on the phone. Has a cat or dog ever showed up at your building saying, man, I'm starving. Can, do you guys have any, do you guys get any food donations? I don't want to have babies. Can you, you know, give me a spay me and neuter me? I, I, there's these worms in my heart. You, can you, a cat or a dog in the history of cats and dogs has never called anyone or showed up anywhere to advocate for itself. A cat or a dog that's on the street that is free roaming or ne neglected and skinny has never got that way because it chose to go that way on its own. On the other side of the coin, a cat or a dog has never got itself adopted. Although my dog kind of did, he just showed up, so I guess he kind of said he's gonna live with me and I didn't really have a choice. But the point here is that our clients are really people. They, it's always been about people. But because a lot of us, and I'm gonna admit it first so I don't put anyone on the spot, have you ever said, I work with animals because people suck? <laughs> You're all lying, because everyone who works with animals has said that. I said it, and that's how I went. I used to work just with people, and I said, I'm so friggin' sick of people, I'm, I'm over people, people suck, people are the worst, I'm gonna go work with dogs, right? Joke was on me, because now I would do more with people than I ever did by trying to work with dogs, right? And so the point here is that we have to shift when we talk about what it means to reimagine, we have to think of people as our clients, families as our clients, communities as our clients and not cats and dogs. Cats and dogs are often gonna be the recipients of the good work we do and benefit from it, but so are the people. Who in here has a pet? I know this one will get hands up, right? Don't you feel good when, some, when your dog gets helped or your cat gets helped? Doesn't it make your family, your home, your life better when your dog gets helped? If your dog is sick and the vet, you have a great vet and the vet helps your dog and your dog feels better, doesn't your household feel better? Don't you feel better? Doesn't your level of stress go down, right? When, your dog, when, you, when you get a new dog, you bring it home or a new cat and your kids go crazy and smile or your, your um, more senior family members like get a little burst of energy when they get to spend time with the cat or a dog. So when you help the dog, you are helping the people. When you help the cat, you are helping the people, and vice versa. So we have to reimagine and shift our thinking to what our job, our industry even is. You know? And the second part of that, of why I think that's important, is people are the greatest asset that we have. People are not the enemy. There's a, if you study psychology, which is what I went to school for, uh, mostly because I'm psycho, so I needed to figure out my own brain. Uh, people need someone to blame. When we see bad things, when we see things that upset us, that piss us off, or that hurt our heart, which you see when you work in, a, in the shelter and rescue environment nonstop, every day, seven days a week, all the time, right? It's hard. There's a trigger that happens in our mind, and that's normal. It doesn't make us bad people. It's normal. Is we need someone to blame. We need to, we need to find an explanation for why this dog came in so skinny. We need to find an explanation for why this cat is, is maybe needs is to be euthanized. We need to find an explanation for everything that we see that hurts our heart or that pisses us off and makes us angry. 
So who are we going to blame? We're not going to blame the trees. We don't want to blame the pets, right? So we blame people. If you do that every day, multiple times a day, sometimes dozens of times in the course of one day, what happens is after enough telling yourself that story, repeating that story to yourself day after day after day, you really start to have a skewed version of what people are. Your perception of people becomes, you see through this, these glasses that are tinted with hate sometimes, with anger, with rage. And so when the person comes who is trying their best and just wants your help, the way we interact with that person is now changed. The way we see people has changed. And we're never, we've been doing, yes, there's been some innovation made in animal welfare over, de, over the past couple decades that I've been in it, but in many ways, we've been doing the same thing the same way for decades in animal welfare. There are some innovations, you know, we do a lot better job with community cats now. We used to never, we used to not do things like TNR and things like that. Thank God we're doing a better job with that. We do a better job, like we're starting to do, be more open with our adoption policies. We're starting a little bit to look at some of the social and community factors that impact the work we do, but we're still not that far beyond where we started in how we deal with it. And it's because we're exhausted, we're burnt out, we're under-resourced, and we're like the Dutch boy with the dam. We're constantly working in crisis mode. We're constantly in disaster mode every day. We save this dog, we get a kennel space, there's another dog coming in to put a fill in the space. We transport 50 dogs up to New Hampshire because that's like become one of the big things, right? And in theory, that, that transport's supposed to give us space to breathe and work on better programs. And we don't because there's 50 more dogs that come in because we never say no. As soon as we get a phone call, oh, I saw this dog, he's stuck under a dumpster by the CVS, bring him in. Right? Someone shows up with a, uh, a box of puppies, bring them in. We're constantly doing triage. We're constantly, so we don't have the time. Uh, I keep thinking I'm gonna fall off this stage. It's like an optical illusion. Um, if I fall, someone laugh, then help me up. Uh, <clears throat> so we're constantly in this crisis mode, right? And unless something changes, you're probably not gonna get 50 more staff, and you're probably not all gonna get a, a $20 raise, right? We don't have enough people. The need outlasts our bandwidth, our capacity. That's true for social workers, am I right? It's true for teachers, it's true for people who do, <clears throat> excuse me, community-based work, and it's 100% true for people <clears throat> in the animal welfare industry. It's probably never gonna change. Sadly, that's part of that, is part of also part of our society, that's just America, right? The people that are of service are never gonna get paid, supported, celebrated, and, and have the bandwidth that, you know, the Elon Musk of the world have in there. And they're gonna fly to Mars and we're not gonna have health insurance, right? That's what's gonna happen, that's America, just the way it is, right? Um, so don't take me down that path. You'll all hate me by the end of the day. Or you'll love me, half will hate me, half will love me, we'll just fight. Um, <clears throat> but the point of that is if we engage communities um, and people in our communities, in a more positive way, in a more hopeful way, in a more open way, they become assets to us. They become the solution versus the person we have to blame all the time, versus the person we have to hate. Would they start to, and that also starts to shift and change us. We start to see, hey, this guy who came to drop off his dog, not only did he not drop off his dog, now he's here three days a week volunteering. Now he has a job in the kennel, right? Now I see this person as someone who's an asset, an ally, a colleague, a comrade in this effort for me to help animals, right? It helps us shift. So how do we do that? There's a lot of factors that come into play. I'm gonna tell you something that you might not be aware of. If I'm not mistaken, everyone in this room is white, mostly, right? Animal welfare is white. It's not that diverse. It's a problem because it's not a problem because I don't care, I'm not here to change anyone's minds on anything socially in the world. I don't give a damn. Feel how you wanna feel. Uh, but the people who love cats and dogs, the people who share their lives and homes and communities and neighborhoods with cats and dogs are not just white. The beauty of cats and dogs, which is something we should celebrate, cats and dogs break down all these ridiculous, 
constructed barriers of tribalism that we've created. That cats and dogs don't know racism. Cats and dogs don't care how you vote. Cats and dogs don't care how you pray. Cats and dogs don't care if you even have a home. Cats and dogs care about that you're good to them. And that's it, right? We have a huge opportunity because we're at a, we're at a unique time in, in our country's evolution where issues of race and kind of social class and poverty are now being coming out like they used to be things that we didn't talk about a lot. They were very kind of, they still make people nervous. I can see some people probably tighten it up now. Uh, don't worry, I'm gonna make you more uncomfortable pretty soon. Um, but these are important things because we've also, like it or not, positioned people of color, particularly uh, in the African American and Latino community, and particularly in lower socioeconomic communities, which again, America, these things tend to go hand in hand. In your community, a lot of the areas of highest intake are also the areas of the lowest socioeconomic status, people living at or below the poverty level. It's just a fact, it's true in pretty much all 50 states. Those communities also, not coincidentally, typically uh, have a high percentage of uh, people of color, black and Latino and other, right? This is just the nature, I'm not, we don't have to go down the path of why that's all true, that's a much longer conversation, but it's reality and it's true. We don't engage those communities the same, or at all, often, right? Because what we've told ourselves, like I said earlier, is that those are the bad communities. Those are the communities where the dog fighters are. Those are the communities where people don't love their pat, cats and dogs the same. Those are the communities where all the dogs are skinny and have heart guard. Those people lock, leave their dogs tied up in the backyard. We've told ourselves all these stories about these communities because a lot of it is to help curve that, the pain and the hurt and the anger and frustration we have about what we see in our building. But most of us, don't live in those communities, don't socialize in those communities, don't know people or have family in those communities. We're going on a lot of assumptions. So <clears throat> we have to engage all people, but we also have to better engage the people um, from the communities that aren't the ones we typically share with them. Um, and I have, I always like to share a couple stories to highlight this. Who was here when I spoke 100 years ago, whenever that was? Okay, so this is a bunch of new people, which is great. So 2011, I was working in Philadelphia in a neighborhood called Hunting Park. At the time, it was considered the poorest, uh, the lowest economic uh, neighborhood in America. 92% uh, African American community, some Latino, mostly black. I was there as part of, you may have heard of, uh, a program called Pets for Life. I was one of the people who helped found that. At this time, it wasn't called Pets for Life yet. It was part of the End Dog Fighting program, which was a, I have pit bulls myself, and it was a program that was obviously what it was to end dog fighting and to advocate for pit bulls. Um, so I moved to Philadelphia from New York, originally from Boston, but I've lived in 100 places. So I go to Philadelphia. The core of that program, which what I brought to it, which, is which was community outreach, community organizing. This is something I had done for 20 years for people. I'd done this around gang intervention and violence interruption and a lot of different issues that had nothing to do with cats and dogs. Um, I grew up, just so you know, I ventured some time of my life on what they would say the, the wrong side of the tracks myself. Um, I spent some time uh, in trouble, let's just say it that way, you don't have to know my whole life story. So, and I grew up in those types of communities. So I have a personal relationship with it as well. Um, so I get to Philadelphia. I, the first thing I do, I, I, go to, I go to the shelter, I find out where's the highest areas of intake. Of course, they're in the poorest neighborhoods. Ever since you can't go over there, there's full of gangs and dog fighters and maniacs and psychos, it's awful, blah, 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 blah. That's what the story I was told. So I go to that neighborhood every day and I just walk down the streets and talk to people. Seems easy. Most people don't want to do that. Most people are terrified to do that. Most people are scared to do that or are uncomfortable doing that in their own neighborhood. Never mind a neighborhood where they don't know anybody and a neighborhood where the entire neighborhood is predominantly black and has a bad reputation, right? But that's what I do. I'm not uncomfortable. And I know that that's the path to help people, right? So I start doing that just talking to people. I meet people at the barber shops, on the porches, on the steps, all over the place. Um, so then we develop what the program's gonna be. We're gonna offer free spay and neuter. We're gonna offer um, you know, heart guard and flea and tick medication, some leashes and collars. So I fill up my Jeep. 
um, with a bunch of crap in the back. And every day I go to the neighborhood and I just start knocking on doors, talking to people. Half the houses have dogs and cats on the porch. So I'm like, hey, you need a free leash. Everything's free. You need a free bag of food, blah, 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 blah. I do that week after week after week. I start meeting people. We start signing people up for spay neuter. I'm, I'm also a dog trainer, so we start doing free dog training classes. Eventually, I meet a uh, young 18-year-old uh, African-American kid named Devell. Devell is about 6'2", 240 pounds, big kid, rough neighborhood. One of the sweetest, quietest, nicest kids I'd ever met. Oh, I was in trouble. <laughs> so I never know who the FBI could come in and get me. Uh, so I've come to find out Devell is the biggest pit bull breeder in North Philadelphia. So immediately, animal welfare people, uh, from animal welfare, we hate the pit bull breeder, right? Pit bull breeder is the devil. Pit bull breeder is working against us. The pit bull breeder is why every day we go to our kennel and we see pit bull, pit bull, pit bull, pit bull, pit bull, pit bull. But we can't get, we can't adopt them, right? Like there's, there's not a lot of people worse, maybe the dog fighter, but we tend to loop them together, right? So I got a young, big black kid who's breeding pit bulls, selling them to everybody in the neighborhood. But I love this kid. I don't want him to breed pit bulls, but he's a sweet, smart, intelligent kid. He loves dogs. You cannot, this kid loves dogs. As much as me, I love dogs. Uh, so much that I don't have children, because I like dogs better. Um, so no offense if you have children. Uh, they're, they're, they're just fine, but I like dogs better. <laughs> Anyways, so Devell starts volunteering with me, because he's also great at training dogs. But I tell him, I said, Devell, you can't, he wants a job. I said, I can't hire you. I work for the main side of the United States. You breed pit bulls. Like, you know, they'll kill me. They'll burn me. They'll come after me with torches and shotguns, right? But he, he, I said, but you can volunteer. And he has his main dog, Ace, who's amazingly well-trained. Amazing, brilliant dog. I'm a dog trainer. He trained this dog better than I ever could. So he starts bringing him to the class. I started letting him use his dog as a demo dog, which if you don't know, he just does, he would do like shows, basically, for my classes. No leash. Dog was perfect. Dog did everything. But the dog had no Dog had massive balls. <laughs> this dog was intact and obviously intact, right? Not all intact animals you notice right away. You see where I'm going? You noticed right away, right? It's the only thing bigger than his head. So <laughs> people start asking me questions. How can you have this kid, right? Every, all the animal welfare people hate me. All my colleagues hate me. My team, I'm supervising people. They're like, they want to quit. They're like, what are we doing? Like, you know, this guy's the pit bull breeder. Oh, his dog with big balls. People, everyone, every day bombarding me with just hating me. And I said, relax. We're gonna get, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get to it, right? So Devell, after weeks go by, he's bugging me constantly for a job. I said, I'll make a deal with you. You fix Ace, your one demo dog. I'll hire you the next day. Twenty dollars an hour, give you a job. Right? $20 an hour, I know where I grew up, $20 an hour for a lot of people is like a million dollars, right? He said, but he loves Ace, he doesn't want to fix Ace, Ace is, he's selling a lot of puppies off of Ace, right? So I said, Devell, come with me, meet me at, the, at this address tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. Devell had never seen the inside of an animal shelter before, never in his life, right? I knew what he was going to see, right? He meets me, we go into the shelter, I walk him into the cage. This is the P PSPCA, the Pennsylvania Society of Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, right? One of the oldest shelters in the country, huge, big, urban shelter. You know what he saw, right? Go on the aisle. Devell says to me, sometimes this makes me cry, so he says, that's my dog, that's my dog. He saw about 20 dogs that he bred, and I told him, I said, all those dogs are going to die, all of them. Dead. I just sat there with him for a minute. Because he loved dogs just like me. You know it hurts your heart. Who here has had to euthanize a dog? Make the decision. You cry, right? It breaks your heart every time. How many times you do it? Me too. I'm visualizing because I've done it. I'm visualizing. It's why I get choked up because I remember them all. And Devell, crying, he, he, his heart broke. I watched his heart break in front of me, right? And that was an opportunity. I talked to him, I bought him lunch, we talked. Long story short, Devell got all his dogs fixed, stopped breeding, and became 
the number one spay neuter advocate in Philadelphia. I'm still in touch with him now. Sorry, I can't believe I, I usually I stopped crying. Now, now I cry again. You people, I hate you people. Um, <clears throat> see, when you become like an emotional person, these things all get to you. I hate it. I was so much happier when I was just a jerk. Um, <laughs> Long story short, the point of that story, I don't tell that story so you like me or you think it's a cool story. I tell that story because in every single one of your towns, there's a friggin' Duvel. There's someone like that. You'll never meet them if you wait for them to come to you. You'll never meet them if you just want to hate them because they're breeding dogs. We have to go to people, and we have to go to people with an open heart. We have to go to people with an opportunity, with an understanding. There's something called cultural competency. Cultural um, humility is the term I like better. And that's the idea of you have to take the time to learn the culture of other people, all right? You have to take the time to unlearn the norms, the behaviors of other people, people who come from different communities, to understand why people do the things that they do and to do it without a sense of judgment. To, because your life isn't going to get better. You're not going to save more dogs by hating Devel. You're not. You're going to save more lives by giving Devel a chance. Because what's a greater advocate for getting your dog fixed? The pit bull breeder who lives in your hood every day and loves pit bulls? Or, again, don't get offended, the white lady from the suburbs who shows up, which is, you know, most of animal welfare a lot of the time. Let's be real, and it's not a hate, I love you guys. You guys are here, I, I love the work you do. But your voice is never gonna ring true the same as Devel's is in his community. So engage Devel, this, is, this was you know, 15 years ago, I just talked to Devel the other day. Devel now uh, does exotic animal shows to schools. He has snakes and reptiles and still advocates for spay neuter. This was a kid who, he didn't have even heard the term spay neuter before. He'd, he'd, he'd never seen a shell. He doesn't know anything about this world we live in. It's com it's, he's completely left out of it. But because like, well, I, I treated him like a person and gave him a chance and an opportunity and wanted to show him this world we live in without beating him up about it, I, I created an advocate. I created someone for the rest of Devel's life. He'll never buy another pit bull again. When he's ready for his next dog, I, how much he's going to go to the first shelter, wherever he lives now, and adopt a dog. When his cousins and his friends and his boys all want a dog, he's going to say, come on, we can go get, you want a big head pit bull? There's a, 200 of them at the shelter down the street for free, or for 40 bucks, or whatever the adoption rate is, right? And so I share that story because what I want, when I, when I think what it means to reimagine animal welfare, I forgot my slides. Uh, <laughs> um, when I think of what it means to reimagine animal welfare, that's what it means. Like, when, when you all do your budget for the year, whether you're a big shelter or a small rescue or whatever like that, most people have zero dollars committed to community outreach. Zero. It's not even on the radar, right? If I could dream the future for animal welfare, it would be a high budget, a high item on the spreadsheet. If we dedicated and committed real time to going into the community to meet people like Devel, right? To meet good, all the, there's so many more great people than bad out there in every community. The vast majority of people, just like everyone else, wake up and they want good for their lives. They want good for their animals. They want good for their families. They want good for their neighbors. The vast majority of people want and are trying to do the best they can for themselves and their animals and their families. They are. And they're waiting out there for us and we never freaking meet them because we don't, we're exhausted, we can't have time to leave our building, but we're also, we don't, we haven't had what I, I personally, in my opinion, no one has the courage yet to change the way we do this work. We've been doing it the same for a long time. And I know, I think there's a couple ACOs back there, am I right? Right? So I've, I've worked on that side of the equation too. I'm not, I don't live in friggin' unicorns and rainbows land. Trust me, there's bad people out there. There is people that do bad things. And I'm so grateful that we have people like you to go get them, because that job sucks. I wouldn't want it. You couldn't give me enough money to do it. Like, my, you, my whole life being committed to catching bad guys is a job. I, at one point, I was uh, hired for the 
for a long LEO job in Massachusetts, which in Boston, when you are an animal control officer, you're part of the state police, you go to the state police academy, you're fully, you know, your badge as a state police officer. And I was hired, I took the gun class, I was gonna do it, and the last minute I changed my mind and, and did something else. So like, I'm grateful that we have people, because there are people that suck and do bad things to animals, there are. But if you, I love pizza, who likes pizza? I took a hard right here. If you cut a pizza into eight slices, right? If you cut a pizza into eight slices, seven of the slices are good people trying their best, and one slice is the, the pieces of shit. And I'm, I'm sorry if I cursed and offended anybody. I can't help it. I'm an Italian guy from Boston. Um, who hurt animals. The people who intentionally wake up and say, I'm not going to feed this dog, fuck this dog. The people who you know, throw hot water on the dog or fight a dog or, or torture a dog or a cat, they are out there. But they're not the, they're the one slice of pizza, maybe half a slice of pizza. And that's their job to go get them. And I really appreciate it. I'm glad you exist. But that's not the rest of our jobs. It's not. That's not the rest of our jobs. Just like cops, you know, the whole fight about the police over the past few years. Like, we've lost our mind. Like, cops now have turned into this paramilitary with tanks and stuff, like smashing in communities to attack people, when the vast majority of people, just like the vast majority of people on trying to hurt dogs, aren't trying to hurt each other either. They're just, they're desperate. They're, 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 they're struggling in life, and they're trying to figure it out. And, like, we, we as the non-enforcement folks, Leave it to them. I tell people all the time, when there's true cruelty and neglect, where someone is intentionally trying to hurt a dog, call these, the people that that's their job to go get them, and then go get them. And I don't care what you do to them. But that's not 90% of the people. Our job is everyone else. Our job is the people who I was talking with um, Jennifer, my new friend, who you're gonna, who's going to speak with you later, about um, I met a um, Latino woman uh, recently in Florida, I, cons I do consulting now, I was consulting with Broward County Animal Services, which is the municipal shelter down there, and we, we do an outreach. I take people out into the neighborhoods and do this work for real. We don't just sit here like this, we go out and really do it. Every place I've done, done it in now, almost 40 different cities, from Compton, Chicago, Philly, every city you can think of in America, at some point I've probably been there and taken animal welfare people to do outreach. All right, just did it in Broward County a couple months ago. And there was a woman, she, and I saw her coming out, old, like, little lady. She had a plate with, like, some crushed up tortillas and some rice and beans. She was bringing them to the yard to give to the dog. And a couple of the animal people were like, oh, my God, I hate when they do that. Like, it's going to make the dog sick. It's going to get warm, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, stop, pause for a second. She's taking food out of her not very nice house, coming outside to bring to the dog. Is she doing that because she hates the dog? She's doing it because she's a terrible person? She's doing it because that's probably food that some of the people on house would love to eat, but she wants her dog to eat. We have a chance right now to go talk to her about and get, offer her some free food and some, some help her build a, a better um, shaded area for, for her dog so they're not in the heat. We have an opportunity to do something good and then help that person help that neighbor because then she can pass it on and on and on and on and on, right? But it starts with that initial, what's the initial tick that happens in our brain when we see that, right? If we're not in the business of helping the people who are in the most need, what the hell are we doing? Does the, 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 the family with the Labradoodle who live in the McMansion in the suburbs, do they, they don't need you. I'd argue that their dogs are neglected too, They're sitting in a cage sometimes 12 hours a day, but we don't go get them, right? You don't get calls about them very often. Yeah, because no one thinks of, frankly, the white family with the Labradoodle they got from a breeder who's in a crate 12 hours a day as being neglected. I think they are. That's another story, but it's not about whether it is or it isn't, it's about what clicks in our brain. What, does our, what, what, what message does our brain tell ourselves? We tell ourselves that 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 woman given the rice and beans or the, the, the black kid with the dreadlocks who's got his, the big chain on his pit bull, our brain tells us those people aren't good pet owners, right? And we don't want to have these conversations. We don't want to be honest about it. But it's true. Animal welfare started in many ways as taking pets from people who we didn't think were worthy and deserve them and giving them to people that we thought were better. Still a lot of what we do, right? And we ha if we can't get through our own biases, our own, our own stuff out there. Oops. 
I don't know why I even bother doing a PowerPoint. Um, if we can't look at our own biases, our own stories, and we're not bad people for thinking this, we're just freaking people. Like, like I said, I understand why people get this way. I've been this way. I understand why we feel the way we feel. Life is hard. You see a lot of hard stuff, it gets even harder. And you, you have to rationalize it to, to yourself, right? You have to like create explanations for yourself so you can get up the next day and do it again. It's hard. I get it. I'm not saying we're bad. I'm certainly not saying anyone's racist or evil, awful people. That's not what I'm saying. This is about the work. How do we do the work better, more efficiently, more effectively? How do we get to the point where we actually can save them all? How do we get to the point where we're not constantly in crisis mode, saving all the dogs and cats that are come pouring into our building? Because they all started somewhere. They started in a community with someone who loved them and wanted them. 99% of the time. If we can get to them then, before they're at complete desperation mode at our front doors, maybe we never have to see them. Maybe we can support them in their community more, more effectively, right? But someone, ha and if anyone wants to and anyone has a budget, hire me, I'm cheap. As a consultant, I'll come do it. I'm waiting, I've been telling, I work with everyone in the country, I'm like, someone take, someone, invert their program. Someone put most of their money, resources, time, and staff out into the community and not in the building. I'll come help you do it, and it'll change. I think that's the change. Reimagining animal welfare, the future of animal welfare, is less of it happening in the building, less, less of it happening at desperation, DEFCON 2 mode, where people have no options, and happening seven stages before that, where people and pets are actually helpable. Because I've seen it work. I've seen it work are on the country, but it doesn't last. It works for a little while, people get excited about it, and then I leave town and a few months go by, and, it go, and we revert back to what we know, right? Change is hard. I'm gonna speak again later, and that one I only have two, two slides, but that's gonna be about change. Change is hard, right? Who, who, who wakes up every day and says, I wanna get in better shape, I wanna start exercising, or stop smoking, or whatever it is you wanna do, right? But you don't do it, <laughs> right? Because it's hard, it's friggin' hard. Change is hard. To learning anything new and changing in a fundamental, significant way is extremely difficult. Especially when you have an industry like we work as a concentric force. We don't really work in a vacuum. So like what you do in your shelter or your shelter or your rescue, like they're all kind of have a symbiotic connection to each other. Cool. Um, so we haven't shifted the industry. I worked for HSUS, I worked for Best Friends, I worked for Animal Farm Foundation, I worked for an organization called CARE. Like I worked for all these big national organizations. And they all start off with this like thought leadership and like you go to the big conferences and it's all about thought leadership and the future of animal welfare. But then we all go back and kind of do basically the same things we've always been doing, right? Not because we don't want to, because it's friggin' hard. It's hard, imagine going, to, is there, are there any board members here of a shelter? Imagine your executive director comes up to you and says, this year we're doing a whole new thing. We're gonna put 75% of our budget is going to community outreach and we're gonna fill up vans and we're gonna go to the poorest neighborhoods and that's where we're gonna do all our work now. That gets voted down in, um, at the meeting every time, right? But someone's gotta take it, if someone's gotta try, or you're still gonna, you're gonna continue to be exhausted, you're gonna continue to be burnt out, you're gonna continue to use tequila as a coping mechanism, that's a joke for anyone who has an alcohol problem. Like, but I do notice a lot of tequila in animal welfare. Um, but, and I say it as a joke, but it's actually not. It's, it's, it's hard. And, and we take a lot of um, out on, we take a lot of it out on ourselves, right? Because we see a lot of hard stuff. So um, someone's gotta take, okay, this is the one I wanted to keep up there. Okay, so I'm glad there's a social worker here um, because in my next, when I talk later, I want to give people some practical, real things that you can take home and change. I will tell you right now, one of the first things you should all do if you work in rescue and shelter and this is your job, take one day a week or a month, I know this is going to be hard to do, forget about the animals for, for one day. Do some research, set up coffee meetings with the social workers, the schools, the churches, the domestic violence, battered women shelters, the food pantries. Research, you can do it in a quick Google search, all the organizations that are designed and there to support the people and families in the communities you work in. Set up meetings with them and just 
make, help them be aware that you can help their family's animals and build a partnership. Because I'll tell you right now, I will, all those places have people just like you, they're burnt out and exhausted trying to help the people, but they notice the cats and dogs that these people have. And if they have you as a resource to go to, to help with the cat and dog, and you have them as a resource to go to, you'll holistically be able to help the families more effectively. And I will get, guarantee you, many of those pets stay with their families and don't end up at your shelter. Build partnerships with your non-animal specific colleagues that work in the communities you work in. They are out there. They, they would love to have another resource, another tool in their toolbox to help the families that they work with. They would love it. I, when I did this work, I would have wished, I didn't know that this whole animal world existed. I wish I did at the time. I had so many families where, you know, the, you, imagine they have a food pantry for people. Why can't there be dog food and cat food in there for people, right? But you have to take that initiative to do it. You have to take this to do that. Set up some time with your leadership of your programs and your teams and say, how can we connect with the human service providers in the communities we are serving? I'm telling you, it will make your lives easier, it'll make your work more, more effective, and it'll actually give you a little joy once in a while. You'll see families do better. You'll see the quality of life of cats and dogs along with people. Cats and dogs, pets live at the same quality of life as their people usually. So if, you're, if the dog is unhealthy and skinny and hungry, you can bet that the kids probably are too. If the dog is maybe dirty, doesn't have clean, clo clean, clean clothes, <laughs> clean, a clean coat, the kids probably do too. Dogs and cats live just like at my house. My dog sleeps in the bed and eats like special food I have to order from friggin' Switzerland and all this other stuff. Like, lives in the lap, he, I pulled him out of a dumpster, a pit bull, like now he lives in the lap of luxury, right? Well, he lives well, I should say, I don't live in the lap of luxury. But he lives like I live, right? The same thing is true at a lower level. And so make those, these allies that are out there, You'll, you'll also meet people that you can kind of talk with and share stories with. You can talk to, I, I'm telling you, so I also do consulting for um, a large social work network for social workers. I do consulting on leadership and work culture and kind of these motivational things. Hopefully this is motivational. Um, I like to pretend it is in my little brain. Um, but social workers, and I think in animal welfare people have incredible similarities. Um, because of the, the, the need being so extensive and what we have to offer not being able to match it and to meet it uh, most of the time. And there's different kinds of social workers, right? There's kind of your, I worked as like a social worker for like the city like, and for big programs. So like, but then there's social workers that do you know, counseling. The social workers do a whole long different type of things. Um, but just like you guys do all different kinds of things, right? But I really want to encourage you to make allies for people that are working with people specifically. So social work, there's a couple here. I'm sure you can uh, tap into your local networks. Find people that are working with, not just social workers. Like I said, faith-based organizations, you don't have to be Christian to work with the Christian church. You don't have to be Muslim to work with the mosque. You don't have to, you know, uh, you don't have to be anything to partner with people, right? If there's a domestic violence, there's all kinds of research and data that, you know, uh, one of the main reasons a lot of women stay in violence situations, domestic violence, is because they don't want to leave the pets. There's a lot of study and research on this. A lot of kids, there's a very direct connection to people that abuse animals, that abuse children, like, and, and, and that are violent. Like, connecting with people whose job it is to serve the people in the communities you work in is going to help you serve the pets better and you build partnerships, and you, there's a lot of great that can happen, good can happen from that. I'm gonna give you some more detailed stuff when I talk later about how to do that, but one simple thing you can do, if you work with these partnerships, I created in Philadelphia, where I taught, where I met Devel, a laminated card, uh, a little bit like, you know, the size of like a passport, right? On that passport, it just had the list of service providers with their phone numbers, and it had a mix, it had, Food bank for pets, food bank for people, domestic violence shelter, after school tutor, tutor, free tutoring program for kids, free dog training class that had animal and human things on it. And it was part of our outreach. We handed it out to everyone. We had it at the desk for the shelters when we did community outreach block to block. We left it on doors, on door hangers. Just creating a simple laminated card, you'd be shocked to know how many people 
need help and don't know where to find it or, or, or how to access it. Just knowing where to go and who to call solve, can solve so many problems uh, for the animals and for the pets. But it, it's, really, it's a really great little tool. Like that'll cost you $30 at, at Kinko's. Is Kinko's still a thing? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I live in, I, I'm, contrary to what you see here, I'm super antisocial. I never leave my house. Um, but I really want to encourage you to do that. Make partnerships with all those human service providers, create eliminated carved services, and give it out to everyone you possibly can. Um, as, you do, as you do that, okay, five minutes. I'm keeping track of time because I'll just keep talking, so I have five minutes. Um, as you do that, this not, that's not this slide. I'm going to get to this in a second. The partnership has to be mutually beneficial. It's important. If you want to work with the church or the school or the um, shelter or whatever it is for the people, you have to make sure you're going to as something to provide as well. You, we can't just go to people and say, you need help and what can you offer me? It has to be mutually beneficial. It has to be a two-way partnership. So that's the key. Like Whenever you set up these coffee meetings, um, I do them all the time. Um, I still do them in my, where I live in New Orleans. I set up coffee meetings all the time. Right now I'm working with um, a reproductive justice group for women, young women of color. I'm married to a black woman who's the CEO of a public health organization. So she makes me do this stuff, but, um, but I believe in it. And so I just set up these coffee meetings. And I always make, one of the things I always tell myself is, the only thing I'm bringing to the meeting is one thing I can do to help their mission. What's one thing I can do to help what, what you need? what your work is. So whenever you do, and I hope you do, set up these meetings to have coffee with people, bring with you just one thing you can offer. It can be a small thing, but one thing you can offer. That helps to build the partnership. Okay, so I wanna get back, we're gonna take this full circle to people. How do we, because it sounds nice, and I assume most people in here are like on board and like, yeah, this, this guy makes a little bit of sense, he's not an idiot. And we want to better engage people, right? But we have, it, just like getting in shape, just like everything else, like we have to do some work because we've built up scar tissue. Our, our feeling of people now isn't that great all the time. And again, I'm not saying you're all terrible people who hate everybody, but I'm saying when it comes to the work and the animals, we've created a narrative around what the role people play, and it's usually a negative one, right? So we have to do some work to break down that scar tissue and kind of create a new reality. So the first thing we have to do is honest self-reflection. I think when I spoke here before, I only had one slide and it was the mirror, picture of a mirror. Um, so you have to look at yourself honestly. You have to take some time to sit and really do this. Like I said, I meditate every day, and uh, that's when I do a self-reflection for me. And I, mine, which is I have a weird minute, I always say, how did I suck today? And I think to myself, how did I suck to my wife? How did I suck to my friends? How did I suck in general? And I just, and I don't beat myself up about it, but I just want to acknowledge, I because I suck sometimes, so I suck today, right? So you do it your way, but first step is to take some time to really look at yourself. Is he right? Do I think people suck? Do I sit in my shelter every day and like tense up about the person who drops off their cat or their dog? When, in, isn't that why we're there? Didn't, isn't the whole reason we exist to be a place for people to bring their pets when they're in trouble? And then they do it and we get mad at them. It's a little bit crazy, right? Like the whole reason we exist is to help people who need help with their animals, that when they come and ask us for help, we get mad at them. Or they come to adopt a dog and we tell them no, because of the way they look maybe, or our perception of them, or because we've told ourselves a story that big dogs are harder to walk, or pit bulls are this way, or this or that, right? When in reality, this person came. They want to leave with a dog. Every person that comes to get a dog should leave with a damn dog, right? You gotta get these dogs out of here, right? But we don't but it's because of the stories we've told us about people, right? So we have to start to look in the mirror and we have to check our biases. The, 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 it is important that we start looking at race and equity and things like that because this is an industry that lacks a lot of diversity. A lot of majority of the communities that are of high intake, where there's the highest need, are typically communities of color, underserved in every area for people, for pets, for everything. And we have to have, start having some honest, Reflection, but some honest conversations. It's okay, the world won't end if you have a conversation about race at lunch or about your meeting. We have to be able to talk about these things and be able to, that's the only way we can progress. And you have to be able to be willing to be, get comfortable being uncomfortable, right? I try to make people uncomfortable at least a little bit because I think it's important, that's where growth happens, right? Growth only happens during 
when there's discomfort, you know? So we have to have these conversations. You have to be willing to be constantly learned. And when you do start to develop some new habits and some new thinking, you have to share it with other people. You can't keep it to yourself. You can't you know, tuck it under the mattress and hide it as your own personal treasure. Share it with people. If you have a good experience with someone that you, you may have initially judged and thought wouldn't be a good adopter and it goes incredibly well, scream it from the, tell everyone at your organization. Post it on, I don't have Facebook, but I have Instagram. Post it on social media. But look at this awesome adopter, right? Because go to social media for animal, it's a lot of negative stuff, right? When you have something good and something changes and shifts and you have a new experience with, with that counteracts the narrative that you may have told yourself, share that shit as, as much as you share the negative stuff. We don't, we don't, that's why I put hold the good. The good things that happen, you have to hold on to them and you have to cherish them and share them with everybody in life and in work because the world's a freaking mess right now. It really is. And your job is hard, right? And those things are not... Um, not, not unrelated, right? The state of the world, the tension in the world, and the kind of polarization of the world, and the anger and frustration and, and anxiety and stress that people are feeling in the world is in your shelter. You know, the animals feel it, right? You feel it with each other. So when good things happen and you have success, we've got to shift again. We've got to share the good things that happen and scream those good things that happen excuse me, a hell of a lot more than we do the bad things and the struggles. It's really important. Um, so <clears throat> that's my time for today. I, I want to thank you guys. I'm really appreciative. I never understand why anyone wants to hear me friggin' talk ever. Um, but people do. I hope it at least taps something in your brain to think a little bit differently and in your heart. And um, I'm going to talk again with you later. I'll be here all day. I'm happy to talk with anyone. But the last thing I'll leave you with is this. is like... <clears throat> It's going to get worse if we don't change. It's not going to, we're not going to fix the problems. It's not going to get better if we remain the same. It's only going to get better if we change. We can't look, no one's going to change it for us. No one's coming to save us, man. Like, so if you want things to get better, we have to change. We have to change the way we look at people, change the stories we tell ourselves, and change the stories we tell others. We have to change. Because we're going we're gonna to burn out. We're going to flame out this way. So anyways, I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Kenny, it's great to have you back. <laughs> um, we are getting ready to break now to go to Expo Hall. There's a half hour break there. Um, and I really encourage you to talk to the other, other folks there who are, who are doing excellent work too. Um, I just want to comment a little bit on kind of uh, Kenny's uh, description was a bit more colorful than the one I'm going to make. But I think it, he really hit on some important issues. And one of the sort of bottom line issues for me is all of us looking for ways to soften the burdens we all face in our work trying to help people and pets and figure out ways to increase the joys. Because the joys are wonderful, too. We just don't often don't have enough of them. So um, it's it just a point I wanted to underline. So thank you guys for being here. Please go check out Expo Hall, excuse me, Expo Hall, and come back here in about half an hour. Thanks. <laughs>